Hello and welcome to Ask GC Anything. This week we have got loads of questions relating to winter training from indoor training Zwift, how to build your FTP and much more. Yeah, that's right. And if you want to submit questions for us to answer next week, remember you just have to use the hashtag TalkBack down in the comments section or on social media or to be in with a shout at getting your hands on a three month free subscription to Zwift use the hashtag ask DC anything and those are the specific training questions yeah I reckon we should crack on with the first we question so we've got a question coming in from Peter Gron hi GCN I'm attending the sportive La Marmotte next summer and I'm planning to use Zwift for the first three months next year to get my training started my question is what kind of training should I focus on I'm built like a sprinter like Chris Opie or John Travolta me. Not like you. <laughs> and okay at climbing, but slow. So can you mention any specific workouts, sessions, group rides, races that I can do? Well, well firstly, can I say, Peter, I'm quite jealous. The Mama is fantastic sounding sportive, mm. but tough. Don't forget, it finishes up out Duez. So I would focus on probably building your FTP as much as you can. So that's kind of your, your theoretical maximum average power that you can sustain for one hour. And it's really, really important for when riding up long alpine climbs because you get to the top, but maybe even in the same time, but it will mean that you're expending less effort. So the stronger you are, the easier it is to ride up Alps, basically. And I would have thought that would be crucial. Maybe not something to do on Zwift, but later in the year, as you get close to the event, what I would also focus on is making sure you can actually get that FTP out at the end of a long ride. Because, you know, if you've got to go up Alps, right yeah. you want to be making sure that you can still ride really hard after four tough hours on the bike. So some longer stuff. But yeah, on Zwift, I'd go for the FTP builders. Yes, and if you want to get a benchmark, so know where your FTP is now, make sure you look at this video where Sai goes through how to actually do an FTP test. Notice that I'm standing next to, to John, who is going through the FTP yeah. test. I didn't do it. You, you, you copped out. Yeah, I did. Now, the reason for doing a test like an FTP test is that knowing that piece of information is really important in being able to train in the most efficient and productive way possible. And John is, of course, doing a Hope Route event in the summer, which is a multi-day cycling event in super mountainous terrain. <laughs> It is Black Friday as this video goes up, so we have some mega deals on in the GCN shop. We have a limited edition range, the GCN Metallic range, um, but, a, but a warning, because it is limited, uh, we've actually already sold out of the socks. So uh, sorry about that, uh, but loads of other amazing stuff in the range still available, but get in quick. Yeah, and do remember, it's made by the same quality uh, of our, our whole GCN range, so no difference, just yeah, you get that amazing gold finish. Next question, this one comes in from Taylor Levitt. He said that when he trains inside, he becomes desensitized to the feeling of riding up a hill. He feels that his body gets used to riding his bike on level ground. So how often should he raise his front wheel up uh, to on a block to mean that his bike is actually on an angle? James, what do you think about this? Well, to be honest, I when I did my indoor training, I just kept it on a, my bike parallel so I put a block underneath that would keep the bike parallel and I never really changed it I spent a lot of the time out on the road so I wasn't spending you know day in day out on the indoor trainer so I never really got a desensitized feeling when going out on the road um, so yeah but if, if you were actually thinking about you know, wanting to switch up your position and your bike then the wahoo kicker climb is out there that would be a perfect fit for you but there is other ways you can prop your bike up yeah it's funny we actually we've done a little bit of research mm. into this here at gcn video coming out soon where we tested whether or not there is a, an effect on how you ride your bike when you're on an angle um i won't spoil the surprise actually i'm just going to leave it there dangling but uh, anyway make sure you check that one out Sorry, Taylor. Oh. It'll come out soon. Interesting. Right then. The next question we have from Kaggles Golf. Oh, Sorry? <laughs> Kaggles Golf. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't make up the name. Do you need to do crazy long rides to train for a long race, i.e. 200 miles? I, can't, I just can't seem to find the motivation to do training rides over 60 to 70 miles. Of course, this is even worse during the winter months on the trainer. Yeah, well... I never used to, like if I was doing long races uh, in training, I would never ride that miles. distance. Mm. No, what you might find is that when you do your first race of the season, you perhaps aren't quite as strong in the back end of it as you might do later on. 
But I think there are more important things to think about, aren't there? And you can do so much hard work, even just an hour, on the indoor trainer. That you can. Yeah, you can. As long as you mix things up a little bit, you shouldn't find that you come too unstuck. No, and I think it's also about you know motivation through those you know difficult months. So it is you know trying to get out on the winter rise maybe once or twice a week do a longer, more endurance-based ride. But then you can keep your in-the-week rides, you know, like like short, like so I said, and just keep it max effort or, or hard. Maybe do a race. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you're on Zwift or something, a race would be pretty cool. Zwift question now, and the person that is the lucky recipient of three months free Zwift subscription is take it away, David guys. Penny. So congratulations to you. Yeah. And yeah, you got three free month subscriptions. No, free three month subscriptions from Zwift coming straight yeah. your way to really kickstart your winter. Yeah. For this question, I started cycling again last year and it helped me lose over 20 kilograms. Whoa, nice work. Yeah, nice one, man. This year I invested in a better bike and don't laugh, got my FTP up to 215. We're not laughing. Nope, it's good work, mate. I struggled to keep up with my friends on hills. What's the best Zwift workout training plan to follow to improve my performance over the coming winter? All right, well, we, as always, put your question to the mm. coaches at Zwift. They came back and said uh, there are two ways to go fast up hills, of course. Uh, you either continue to lose weight, depending on how close you are already at your optimum weight. And the other one is you actually boost your fitness on the bike. So again, coming back to that whole concept of FTP. Now, I think personally, I wouldn't focus too much on weight loss. I think that will come. More, that's it. The more training you do, mm. the more you'll get closer to that ideal weight, whatever that may be. As we've said, in terms of the training, that they have uh, a winter plan that they think will be ideal for you. It's called the Grand Fondo plan. Lasts between five and eight weeks. They say it includes low cadence and high power intervals and some longer temper efforts. Uh, and it's five hours a week of structured training. So there we go. If you've got any more, then you could do uh, riding outside to complement it, or indeed you do other longer Zwift sessions. Maybe stick a race in there. Mm, I really love doing those, or just a group ride as well. Yeah, so have a go at that, and well, let us know in the comment section below how you get on, and yeah, really good luck with your winter training. The next question in from Lucas Jurizek. I started training this season and lost 30 pounds. Nice. And I plan to race in the next one. Should I do base miles in the off season or not? Would it be better if I focus on FTP training instead? Interesting question. It is an interesting question actually. And uh, you see in the back of shot, we've got uh, a video on this subject. But before you watch that, I think the most important thing is to actually look at how much time you've got available, isn't it? Because base training is important, but it's by no means the most important part of your training. and in its very essence, it takes a long time. So if you're a little bit time pushed, I'd leave leave it, basically. Totally. I'd focus on getting in your FTP, getting as fit as you possibly can through the winter, and actually the kind of base miles will, will come. If you're a pro, then base miles become more and more important. But like I say, it's, it's the it's the bottom of the pyramid and you should focus on it last, I think. Yes, and then the nearer you come to the race season, then you can start focusing on those kind of three minute, five minute interval sessions and that will really help you you know, put the cherry on the top of your training and then you'll be fighting fit for the come race season. That's right, for a bit more information on that mm. base training question, they do make sure you check that video out. Let's just go on behind us now. Yeah, so we put this concept of base training to Professor Passville. And he said, firstly, that actually the idea of having base training as a specific part of your training year is actually really out of date now. Now, he also said that there is no evidence to say that base training has to come before threshold or peak power work. And crucially, for those of us that have got less time to train, we'd actually be better off taking out base training altogether. Right, next question, it comes in from BR Lane. Uh, they are a returning road cyclist from 15 years off the bike, they said. Uh, they've got a new bike, been riding for about a month. They've also got an indoor trainer now so that they can keep riding even on cold, rainy days in Houston. Uh, the question is though, on cold days and on warm, dry days, should I warm up on the trainer before going out for a ride? Mm, well, I personally wouldn't worry about it. It sounds like an awful lot of hassle, getting your bike on the trainer, setting up and then taking off and getting on the road. But on those cold days, I would just tend to get some good kit. So some good bib tights and a good jacket 
and you'll actually be really surprised how quickly you warm up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, maybe the question stems from, from what we see pro cyclists doing before and after races. And to put it in context, often the, well, pros don't get the luxury of being able to ride around before the start of a race because there's lots of fans and things. Mm. So they have to ride on a trainer and often their races will start full gas and they certainly finish full gas. And so actually having a warm up and a cool down after that is, is really effective for helping them get back on the bike the next day. But for you and I going out for a normal ride, we can build that warm up and cool down into our normal rides. For a little bit more info about why pros warm up and warm down. We got one just on the back of back of our screen there. Everybody should have a uh, cool down phase to their training. Um, so when you're out, typically what you do is you, you know either your last interval or um, uh, the end of your workout ends uh, five to ten minutes from before you get home. And so you have that five to ten minutes to really spin the legs and cool. So you don't need to get on the trainer once you get home and ride some more. Right, we're now on to the quick fire round, and we have got Cy Richardson here, and he was putting out some serious watts at the Zwift race last night. So oh, yeah. he's hoping for a quick fire round. For the first question, it comes in for Ros Common Cycling Academy. Team GCN, I'm wondering, is there a way to be able to get better at climbing while doing some indoor training? I'm wondering this question as we have started up a new team and we are trying to get better at climbing. Well, 100%, yeah, indoor training can be super effective yeah. at improving your climbing. I think the thing to do is to actually work out what kind of climbing you want to be better at though, because obviously there's a big difference in what training you do for 20 minute long climbs there or is. longer, so your alpine kind of climbs, or your shorter punchier climbs, your one minute or three minute efforts. But basically, if you factor the length of the climb that you want to be good at into the length of the intervals that you should be doing on the trainer, that's probably a good place to start. Exactly that. Next question. Right, next question, uh, Atlas Gibbons. I'm thinking about taking a break from racing. I didn't enjoy it a whole lot this year. I do enjoy identifying as a cyclist though. Do you think I could still consider myself a cyclist if I'm just riding but not racing? Yes. Hell yeah, absolutely. 100%. 100%, yeah. And, uh, and actually, yeah, taking a bit of time out from racing is a good idea if you didn't enjoy it. Yeah. That is why we do it after all. So yeah, don't stress, just enjoy your riding, do something different. It's a quick Go fly around sign. Yeah, sorry yeah. mate. Next question in from Daniel S. I'm getting ready to buy my first road bike. I'm currently riding my old mountain bike. Is it beneficial to train on a substantially heavier bike or just hurry up and get the road bike? I love everything GCN does. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's no benefit to training on a heavier bike. At the end of the day, the training benefit comes from what effort you're putting in actually. So the power that comes from your legs, how hard your cardiovascular system is working. And so the difference between a heavier training bike and a lighter training bike is that you will just go slower on the heavier bike, but you won't actually get better from riding the heavier yes. bike. And saying that, if you did want to go on those long, nice road rides and really enjoy it, then I personally would just jump straight in and get a road bike just because you can go out far further for less of the effort, really. The next question we have from Dean C. Nash. Are there indoor cycling programs that can help in preparing me for an Ironman? Yeah, James, you better take this one, mate. Yeah, I have been toying with the idea of doing an Ironman and, well, I will use the indoor trainer because I think it will be a really good asset, especially to really hone down that aerodynamic position because, well, you've got to hold that position for 112 miles, which is no mean feat for any human being. That's right, you definitely need to get used to putting power out in that position. Uh, I wouldn't do epically long rides on the indoor trainer you could still get really good hard work get your body used to putting out loads of power in that extreme position and the other benefit of it actually is that when you're out on the open road on a time trial bike you know it's quite hard to put in those long efforts isn't it of maybe sort of 20 minutes or so without getting interrupted by traffic yeah, or can be junctions quite dangerous, yeah. yeah downhills obviously make it harder as well mm. so, uh, so yeah i, I think Pro road cyclists using your trainer a lot on their TT bikes as well. So, uh, so yeah, definitely a great asset. Uh, right, next up, Kyle Peterson. Uh, should you take a day off before a big race, even if there's a pre-event ride slash warm up the day before? Well, I personally used to, I used to race a lot on the Sunday or Saturday, but usually on the Sunday for a one day race. So I would use the Saturday as my easy spin. So I would go out for an hour and a half or two hours and get some good hard openers because the day before was normally a rest day or a travel day. So that's what I used to do. It used to work, but it is very individual. So do what fits 
you really. Yeah, normally I, I'd say like the recovery is kind of the week before, so you maybe for a big event you'd have a lighter week, wouldn't you? So you kind of arrive at the weekend a little bit fresher, and then on that Saturday you could do like a, mm. a sort of a ride with a couple of little efforts in just to open yourself up, make sure that you're not too fresh, yeah. which is always the balance for me. It was you either arrive too fresh and then you don't feel so good the next day, that, or you arrive tired yeah. and then you don't feel so good the next that day. That is the weird thing, isn't it? When you you actually feel a little bit fatigued, you actually end up going better, which is a really bizarre. Way of looking at it. Sometimes, yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, you kind of have to feel your own way through this. But, but yeah, there we go. Definitely ease up a little bit before, but the Saturday before Sunday race mm. is a good idea just to just to do a little bit of it. Right. The next question from Chris Fleetwood: When riding for commuting fitness, is it worthwhile to go clipless? Whoa, that's a tough one. That isn't is it? a tough one. I think most people that try clipless pedals and get used to them don't go back because mm. it feels really nice. But in terms of a, like a performance benefit, you probably wouldn't get much of one. Certainly when you're really pressing on the pedals, then actually it's more efficient to use clipless pedals. Uh, but you've also got to factor in the convenience thing, haven't you? When yeah, I, I think it is all about convenience. I mean, it's much easier just to wear flats and normal shoes, and then you don't have to change your shoes and yeah, put it lycra on, etc., etc. But even a guy in our office wears jeans, t-shirt, jacket, and proper cycling shoes with his cleats on, which, yeah. It's an interesting look. Well, yeah, it was the fact that he was wearing white overshoes that wasn't it, last night. That was very and, uh, interesting. You know, not many people wanted to be seen with him. But, um, you know. Well, not even his missus was that happy about it. No, she wasn't, was she? But uh, it's not surprisingly. Right, okay. Next, Next question. question from Saf1981. And this is my favourite question. And it is. How can I reduce my awesomeness so others will ride with me? Wow. That is a great question. And actually, it's one... For you, mate. It's made for you. Ah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I do ride on my own a lot, James, but it's probably more because so awesome. just no one wants to ride with me, not because <laughs> I'm awesome in any sense. Um, no, I mean, I imagine that's a joke question, I imagine. Uh, but actually, that whole thing about, you know, riding with other people, I mean, sometimes it's nice to ride on your own, certainly if you train at odd times mm. or you've got a, only a short amount of time and you maybe want to go out and ride really, really fast, which is kind of antisocial. Um, so it's kind of nice mixing it up, but yeah. you've always got to, when you are riding with other people, just factor in that they might not want to go as fast or other abilities. they might want to, you know, not sprint for town signs or that kind of thing. So yeah, riding with other people is a sociable activity. Yeah. You know? I, w I was probably the worst for that when I used to go out with clubs. I always used to kind of ride ahead a bit and well, I didn't make many friends. Oh dear. I oh dear. I, I was one of those. The next question from Mike and Ike. Guys, please, please do a whole video solely on sprinting. How to throw your power down, keep an aero position, keep your rear wheel on the ground. Well, Sai, uh, you're probably not the best person to ask this, uh, but we do have our sprinter, Chris Opie, here, and we will be asking this question straight to him to see if he can get some videos out for you. But he, at the moment, is just frolicking around, doing some John Travolta stuff. Yeah, to be fair, John Travolta can sprint though, so uh, yeah. make sure you stay tuned. We'll, uh, we'll definitely have him talk us through the finer points of sprinting. He did one last summer about how to train for sprinting. Uh, I picked up quite a few tips on there, all about strong core. And I mean, you are looking bulky, so yeah. <laughs> Cheeky. And we have gone to the last question from Porik Bannon. Are direct drive trainers always the better alternative to wheel on trainers? Not always, I guess, because you could have a really bad direct drive mm. trainer, but generally speaking, yeah, they're better yeah. because there's no chance of any wheel slippage that you get with the wheel on trainer. Um, and they tend to be a little bit quieter. You don't wear your tire out, but they are, of course, more expensive. Which yeah, can be a slight issue. So they do work both the same way, and you you can get your training out, you know, well with with either or. But yeah, I would definitely say the direct drive trainers are probably the better ones. Yeah, but if you can't afford one, do not worry about it. As James said, you can get the power out, irrespective of the kind of training you're on. Yeah, right. And we've come to the end of this week's Ask GC Anything. That's right. If you want to ask a question for next week, and um, please do, we love answering your questions, then you either use the hashtag TalkBack or the hashtag Ask GC Anything if it's a specific training question. And then, of course, you might end up 
getting yourself three months free subscription to Zwift. Now, why not check out the great video that John Cannings did over in Japan investigating the Kirin racing scene, or Kirin, as I was told. Yeah, I find that fascinating, so do take a look.